Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Campus Church of Bayview. We are so excited to be here this morning together, um, to gather in fellowship and in worship. We're going to stand this morning and sing to our God who is so worthy of our praise.
Welcome here this morning. 
Uh, if you're brand new with us and you don't know who I, name, who I am, my name is Pastor Zach, and I've got a couple of announcements coming your way before we continue on with our service. Um, as always, our text in church, uh, if you're newer with us and you're looking to get connected, uh, please text welcome to that number right above my head. So pull out your cell phone right now. We would love to resource you with everything you need to get connected here at the Campus Bayview. So text welcome to that number. And if you have a prayer request, actually our staff team prays through all these prayer requests every Tuesday at our staff meeting. Uh, so text pray to that exact same number. One night is tonight. If you are in the young adult age range, whatever that means, it could go as low as, I don't even care. It's tonight. One night is a gathering of people to worship, uh, to hear a message, to learn together, uh, to fellowship, to hang out with other young adults. It is happening tonight at 7 p.m. at our storefront, which is actually just right next door in the plaza, literally right here. Uh, another one of our coffee house open mic nights is coming up soon. I actually can't read that. The last Friday of every month, 7 to 9. Uh, so that is coming up the last Friday of this month. Um, if you would like any information on that, or if you'd like to perform, please email amber at amber at the dash campus dot ca. Um, our Mission Sunday is quickly approaching, and uh, we have an exciting weekend planned for our Missions Weekend this year. Um, we are having a human trafficking awareness breakfast Saturday morning um, with speaker John Castles. Um, he's going to be talking, he actually worked with the York Region Police for a long, long time. He's going to be talking about human trafficking, and we're also going to hear from a uh, human traffic survivor from actually right here uh, in Aurora, which is, which is crazy. Um, so that is $5 a person or $10 her family, and that is a cheap breakfast, if you ask me. And then, again, that is on the Saturday. On the Sunday, uh, we are doing our Mission Sunday. So our theme this year is Carpe Diem, Seize the Day. We're going to have John Denbach from uh, SIM Canada. He's the Executive Director. He's going to be coming in and speaking to us, uh, and we're super excited for that. So make sure that you're here also on that Sunday. So the breakfast on Saturday and our Missions Sunday, obviously, on Sunday. And as always, you can connect with us at thecampusbaby.ca for all of our events, online directory, news, info, all that fun stuff is on that website. Just in a minute, we're just going to dismiss the kids, uh, but at this time, we're going to go into a time of soma. Soma is a word that means body uh, and connection. Um, so this is a time where we're going to put five minutes on the timer. You can get up, uh, talk to those around you, and just spend some time uh, fellowshipping. Thank you. What was I created for? I'm more than what you see on the surface. See beneath my skin and scars. I'm skinned and scarred. Marred and twisted. Scarred by the past I need to be lifted. And sometimes I question my own existence. What was I put here for? In my seams, it seems that there seems to be more. It's like I'm a light unplugged from the socket. I mean, do I really exist to put money in my pocket? This nine to five feels like a nine to nine. My mind entwined, I pass the time, life circles me as I wait. What is my estate? I feel like I was made for something great, and yet I can't quite put my finger on it. But when I look at my fingers and I see their design, I realize I'm one of a kind. And something created me. No, someone created me. And that someone made me for a reason. Even though it's clear the past years have been treason, I still sense this drawing, this calling that even in the midst of my falling, there was someone who died to pick me up. Someone who rose to fix me up. Someone who's coming back to lift me up. And that someone is Jesus. See, God made me for a purpose. And when I delight in him, it's brought to the surface. Amen. Amen. We've been doing a series called This Is Us. And we're journeying through this understanding of our core values. What is our core values as a church? What should be your core values as an individual? Because your values are your filter. When you determine opportunities or determine the things are challenges, you put it through a filter, and therefore you're able to see that your perspective, you're able to process those opportunities or process those challenges through those filters, 
And so what I really wanted to do for you over the last week and the next two weeks is get you to understand an inside look into our church's core values. This is who we are. This is what makes us, us. And so last week we looked at number one. Anybody know the answer? Jesus. Are you sure anybody know the answer? Jesus. Our beginning point and our ending point is? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the, the, the main reason why we exist. The reason why we got up early this morning and we did the setup. The reason why you got out of bed and went, I wonder what I'm going to do today. He drew you here to this place called church. And we're so, so glad to have you. So there's this core value of Jesus, and I certainly would encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to listen to it last week, to go on our website, thecampusbaby.ca, and listen to it. You can also download it through uh, iTunes, and we have actually a, a podcast there, so you can just hit subscribe, and all the messages will just come down into your podcast. Uh, but I would just encourage you uh, to make sure you listen to last week's message, because we are committed to the truth of who Jesus is, and who Jesus claims to be, passionate worship, giving and service towards Jesus. The next two values we're actually going to talk about today, uh, it's radical love and acceptance. And I'm not going to say any more because we're actually going to spend the majority of our time with this one and the next one, which is number three, discipleship. And next week we're going to be looking at value number four, which is excellence. We believe that we're called to Make things better. And say, God, how do we improve this for your sake? How do we put our very best before you? And we're going to talk about that next week. But for now, let's uh, just decipher this value number two and number three. Lord Jesus, as we come to you this morning, as we uh, come and prepare ourselves to open up your scriptures this morning, we ask that you would just speak to us. We ask that you, O oh Holy Spirit, would uh, just uh, help us keep away from distractions and help us zero in on what you have to say to us. We ask this in your precious name, sir. Amen. So value number two, love and acceptance. Radical love and acceptance. You know, when we're on a journey and we're traveling through life, we can oftentimes hit bumps and bruises along the way. Maybe it's a series of bad relationships. Maybe it's uh, a, a season of economic hardship or health challenges. Perhaps it's difficult in your work. Maybe things are going great right now, but nevertheless, life has a way of bringing us on this journey, and, and there's challenges along the way. And some way along the way, many of us, including myself, struggle with this, this self-talk. Perhaps people are saying this to you, that you're worthless, that you're terrible. But oftentimes, it's just, a, we're our worst enemies. And sometimes we tell ourselves, I'm a bad parent, I'm a bad spouse, I'm a bad daughter, I'm a bad husband, I'm a bad son. I'm not adding value to you. And we, and we focus and we fixate on our problems and we fixate on our shortcomings. But what do we see in the example of the scriptures? What do we see from what Christ teaches us? Is that we have incredible value. And we're going to dig this up in the scriptures in just a minute. So value number two is that we are care about the people that Jesus cares about. Whether you are close to God or far from God, whether you're walking tightly with God, or whether you've never been to church before, or maybe you go to church, but you totally reject what he's teaching you all the way through the week, and you just kind of maybe somehow show up to church. God cares about you. Do you believe that this morning? God is about both the lost and the found. I, the Son of Man, it says in Luke, I, the Son of Man, have come to seek and save the lost. 
So if you're wondering whether you have value, if you're wondering whether there's substance to this, let me tell you that you are loved. Regardless of your race, gender, orientation, regardless of uh, your economic standing, you are loved and you are welcomed here, period. But this is very closely linked to value number three. And this is what we call discipleship. It's like saying uh, you've arrived here and you say we, we care about you so much that we actually are thoroughly dissatisfied to leave you the same. We want to see you grow and, and go into a deep relationship with Jesus. And you might say, okay, whoa, 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 Pastor Ian. That, those two are counter. You can't say you accept me the way I am and then say, you know, you want to change me. That doesn't work. Let me tell you this. If you're a parent, you'll understand this. And if you're not a parent, you can imagine this. Think about your kids. Or think about your imaginary kids. And think about it. In a healthy context, in a healthy environment, you're not going to fall in and out of love with your children. Right? You're in a healthy environment. You're saying, I love you. I accept you for where you're at. You are my child, period. But on the, on, on, the, on the flip side, you're saying, I really want to equip you. I want to push you. I want to challenge you to grow and to be a healthy and, and valuable adult, right? So it's not saying, oh, I love you and accept you where you are, and there we go. That's not love. Go do whatever you want. No, no, it's saying, I love you so much that there's something that stirs within me and say, I want to see you grow and develop. And I believe our scriptures today articulate this. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me. Uh, and if you have it in digital form, I encourage you to go with me as well because we're going to be hanging out in John chapter 8, uh, verse 2. John chapter 8, it starts like this. At dawn, he being Jesus, at dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Verse 3. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? What do you say? Well, let's get a little bit of context here. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's at the Temple Mount. And he's uh, there kind of gathering around a bunch of other uh, people that want to hear about him, want to know a little bit about him. And these teachers of the law, these uh, individuals who are coming at Jesus, they decide that they want to prove a point here. And it's interesting, the way they do it, it says they force this woman to stand before the group. Talk about group shaming. They force this woman to stand before the group. It says in, in, in here in the NIV, they made her stand before the group. And one of the things that is really kind of puzzling is where's the guy? Where's the other person that should be here? You know, the law that they're making reference to shows up twice in the Old Testament, both in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it says both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death if they commit adultery. Meaning a married man or a single man with a married woman or a single woman. It's saying if they get caught, they should be put to death in Leviticus. So then in Deuteronomy, it says this. It says the law determines that the adulterer and the adulteress 
the man and the woman, if they are caught in the act of adultery, they should be put to death. And so the question then becomes, what's going on here? Well, first of all, I, there's actually very little evidence of this law actually being carried out. I, I, you know what, we could argue that historically maybe this was the case. But I can tell you without a doubt that in Jesus' day, this law wasn't practiced. This law was actually, in fact, uh, something that couldn't be practiced because they were under Roman law. And if you wanted to take out a capital punishment, you had to go to a, uh, the highest courts. And the Romans thought this rule would be ridiculous. So I, in order for this woman to actually be stoned, if someone took stones and threw at her, the Romans would actually arrest those that were trying to stone her. Okay, so th this is not something that they're trying to do. They're not actually concerned about this woman's morality. Just to be clear here. And the other question that I think is very puzzling is, it certainly tells you something about the heart. Where is the guy? Because they, in the actual scriptures here, it says they caught her in the act. And the, and the wording or the phrasing here within the Greek is that they actually physically saw them in the act. So there's no mystery about where the guy is. There's no mystery here. There's fornicator and the fornicator. So, so let me ask you this. Why is this happening? I think these guys, to be honest, are cowards. They're picking on the weaker one. And they're deciding that this is a great way to catch Jesus. Let me tell you, if you want to catch Jesus, don't use this as an option. Verse 6. It tells us a little bit why they were wanting to do this. They were, it says this in verse 6, they were using this question as a trap. They didn't care about the fornication. They were trying to use it as a trap in order uh, to have a basis to accuse him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his fingers. Let's think about this trap for a second. See, the trap really was a, a two-sided trap. Think about this. If Jesus said, go ahead, stoner, what do you think this would tell the crowd? The crowd is around Jesus. All of a sudden, Jesus, who is known for his mercy, who is known for caring for those who are less fortunate, all of a sudden, this Jesus would be highlighted as somebody who wasn't full of mercy and grace. But on the contrary, if Jesus said, don't stone her, well then obviously he's running counter to the scriptures. Obviously he's running counter to the law of Moses, and therefore they can use grounds to say he is not worthy of being considered a teacher of the religious law. And so they were really hopeful that they were going to catch him but not so fast. After they keep challenging Jesus in verse 7 and 8, this is what it says. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and finally said to them, let anyone of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Continues. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. See, these accusers were coming to Jesus, and essentially what he was saying was, you know, as an accuser, go ahead. Go ahead, throw the stone. But there's a slight variation in there, isn't it? It says, go ahead and throw the stone, but you better be sure that you're without sin. I love the way Augustine writes about this particular section of scripture. Augustine writes in one of his historical commentaries, he says, you bring me this sinner who you yourselves are sinners. If you think you ought to condemn sins, I shall begin with you. Jesus is essentially saying, if you think you're worthy of expressing condemnation, then you better be prepared. Because you're ultimately bringing condemnation on yourself. Be prepared for judgment. It's kind of like the Matthew 18 where it talks about how if you want to pull a speck out of your brother or sister's eye, you know, make sure you pull the log out of your own eye first. 
says, what, what he's saying here is, he says, you have to be so careful. Be careful about this judgment. How often do we, as individuals, sometimes struggle with this? How easy is it to cast judgment? Oh, man. That person's here at the church again. Oh, man. This person at work drives me nuts. Oh, man. My spouse obviously doesn't care about me. They say, forgot about this again. Oh, man. My loved one, they keep choosing to screw up over and over again. They obviously, they obviously don't get it. Be careful how we pass judgments. Careful how we put people in a box. Because essentially what Jesus is saying here, be prepared to throw the stone if you are without sin. Look at what it says here in the next verse. Is that this, they began to go away one at a time. Interesting, the ones with a little bit more life experience started going first. The oldest ones went first. Until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there alone. I wonder how you feel as the woman. I wonder what would be going through your mind if you're left there with Jesus. But it's interesting what Jesus does next because he is the only one in this whole conversation that has the right to throw stones. Think about that. Jesus, we believe, is, was totally perfect and was without sin. So Jesus actually had the right, according to what Jesus is saying here, he had the right to stone her. But he instead surrenders his rights and does something totally different. Look at what it says. It says, Jesus straightened up and got down to the same level as the woman. He said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. And Jesus says these very powerful words. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. The one who had the right, the one who had the ability to cast judgment, what does he extend instead? He extends grace. But this grace was paired with something else. It was paired with not just go, I don't condemn you, Go, and it said something else. Leave your life of sin. I love the way it shows up in other translations. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Ultimately, what's happening here within the scriptures is this woman who has, who has done sin, who is in all intensive purposes, and can, when comparing to the law of Moses, is worthless. She's been rejected. She's been spit out. And what does Jesus do? He says, you are loved. You are accepted. You are worthy of grace. Now go in freedom. Go from the condemnation. Go from the shaming. Go from the self-shaming. Go away from this public ridicule. Go for you have freedom. sin no more. It wasn't so much saying, oh, well, yes, I affirm your sin. Yes, I accept you where you're at. Yes, there is an exception of where she's at. But it says, I, I want to call you to a new life. A new life free from this sin. What, he's, what Jesus is doing is he's calling her to make a 180 degree shift. I wonder how many of us are in need of a 180 degree shift. This the pursuit of Christ, oftentimes it's not an overnight thing. I, I love this picture of a ladder, and you're like climbing up this ladder. It's not that you all of a sudden get to holiness and righteousness all at once. And saying, yes, I'm going to make a prayer. I'm going to receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Boom! Sin's all gone. I never have struggles anymore. Good luck. 
I wish the gospel worked that way. But everything we discover within scripture and the examples of scripture is not that way. It is a journey. And so the question then becomes, are we creating the space to allow the Spirit of God to work within our lives and are we putting up barriers between these things? So we're talking about the value of love and acceptance, but then value number three is this whole journey of discipleship. And I think I love the way it shows up when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. In Galatians 5, it's not about what we do. It's not about what we produce. But it says, it says this. When we allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives, He being the Spirit of God, He being Jesus Christ, will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Wow. Cha-ching! We get that all right away, don't we? Anybody ever prayed and said, okay, I need more faithfulness. I need more gentleness. It's not something that you produce. It's the Spirit of God produces it in you when you allow the Spirit of God to work within your life. Are you creating that space? I think there's a big spectrum shift that's happened over the last 50 years within churches and within our understanding of what it means to be followers of Jesus. I think one of the things that, if we go to the next slide, one of the things that we see is this whole aspect of evangelism and discipleship. Oftentimes what we hear about, we, we talk about, is that we need to know about Jesus. And so we talk about evangelism as that kind of that title and that gifting to share and proclaim the word of Jesus both through action and through word. So it's through deed and word that we proclaim the love of Jesus. But there's this thinking and there's this ideology that is thinking that as soon as you come to know Jesus in this supernatural way that like God touches your heart, maybe it's in a, uh, a space of, in a worship environment, or maybe you know, you, your pastor or a friend was talking to you and you received Jesus, and, and it's all awesome. But then there's this idea that discipleship then happens. And, it, and it's kind of wrong thinking because discipleship often is related to all the things that we need to produce. And it's thinking that discipleship is, oh, then I, I've got to look right now that I came to know Jesus. My hair has got to be a certain way if I had hair. Um, I, I, I've got to dress the right way. Um, I don't know if you've met the dress code today. Did you see the dress code sign up in the front yard um, like when you came in? Uh, I, you know, like did you, did you hold your Bible the right way today? Um, like all these checklists. And, if, and I mean, this is a little predating myself, but if you went to church in the 1950s, uh, that would certainly be something that you would experience. That you had to fit within a certain kind of mold, and that meant holiness and righteousness. The challenge, though, is I would argue that both evangelism and discipleship happens both pre-cross and post-cross. What I mean is both pre-coming to know Jesus and after you come to know Jesus. Let me describe this to you. I would argue that you need to know, if you don't know about Jesus, you need to know more about Jesus. And as the people of God, it is our responsibility to communicate the truth about Jesus and his redemption in our lives, both in word and and action. Evangelism. Great. We should be doing that. But I would also argue that discipleship also happens before you ever get to know Jesus. Have you ever talked to anybody who has, you know, come to know Jesus in a personal way after the age 13? I'm just going to throw that age up there. You know, they're, they're old enough to make decisions for themselves at that point. If you were to ask them, how did you know to come to Jesus? Almost without a shadow of a doubt, there was an aspect of discipleship where they were being able to interact, they were able to rub shoulders with other people who follow Jesus, and it wasn't just being told to them, but they were also experiencing what it means to serve Jesus and be in relationship with Jesus. And so one of the things that we do here at this church, and sometimes 
uh, some of the people get you know struggling with it a little bit, is to say that, you know, I don't care where you're at in your relationship with Jesus. We want you to come and jump on board and get involved. I don't care if it's your first time ever coming into church. You're well, if you want to get involved in an aspect in our church, we want you to be a part of it. Now, I, I, I'm, I, I want you to just preface this to say I'm not talking about leadership rules. But there's no reason why people, anyone, can't get involved and get involved in, in serving and getting to know what it means to be a part of the family of God right from day one. Amen? I think one of the things that uh, I used to do, it was my first job, was with Youth for Christ. And I ran a, uh, a program called Spirit Born. And it has about 60 high school students in it, or at least it did at the time. And we had about $80,000 of the sound lighting gear. We put on these big productions. And there were these musical productions, and we used it as a, as a discipleship training tool for young people in this program. And, uh, you know, we teach them from everything from the music, uh, and we'd have live music, to choreography, to uh, we'd have a whole student tech team that was controlling all the sound and lights. It was a really neat operation. And the idea was is that as leaders, as adults, we were engaged because we were wanting to disciple the students. But for the students, they were a part of the ministry team. And so they were going out and communicating the good news wherever they went or part of the team, and we'd go to the point of actually going down to Florida, we'd go into juvenile detention centers in Florida, communicating the good news about Jesus. And every year, I'd usually have three to four students that would join this 60 student performing arts team that were drawn and attracted to it because of the performing arts. They weren't actually interested in this whole Jesus thing. And so my response was, yes, we want you. Absolutely. Now, I got a lot of pushback and say, what do you mean? What do you mean, Ian? We can't have these people coming and they're worshiping God and they're, 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 they're teaching others about how to worship and pray God and, and they're uh, you know, leading others in this understanding of who Jesus is when they don't even believe themselves. That doesn't make sense. All I got to tell you is, Without a shadow of a doubt, every single year, every single one of those students that didn't know Jesus at the beginning, all of them came to know Jesus by the end. Every single time. It's not about us and what we think is correct. It's about saying, hey, we want to create space in the family of God to say, if you want to know about Jesus, we want to tell you about Jesus and we want to participate with you. So when we come to know Jesus and we get to this side of the cross, yes, discipleship is a process. Yes, it's intentional. But I got to tell you, evangelism is just as important. Because I got to tell you, the redemption of who Jesus is and the grace that I experienced at the point of salvation is something that is just as tangible and just as important in my life today as it was in the day when I gave my life to Jesus. It's not what we produce. It's about experiencing God and creating the space for God's grace and God's love to be poured out on us and we were to experience it in the fullness. And so we are called to experience the love of God, not just before we come to Jesus, but every day after as well. For the Jesus I serve is the same yesterday, today, and anybody know? Tomorrow. Forever. Hebrews 13. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if we pair what we're talking about, these values, and now we're really talking about value number three now, of discipleship, we've got to pair it with this missiological calling to go. To go. Because really this is what our universal calling is the church, not just our church here right on Bayview, but the church's universal calling is to experience what it means to be the sent people of God. The Great Commission says this in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, it says, I've been given complete authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go! 
Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to follow all my commands and know this, that I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So if we understand that this is our calling to go and to be missional, not only as individuals and, and also as a church, what does that look like practically? Now, what I've seen in churches is that this, is that there's this pendulum shift that goes back and forth. And so what you oftentimes see is churches that are trying to respond to this, and they really define this as the way to respond in terms of sending people on missions. We have a missions weekend coming up, and on that missions weekend, we're having a special offering. And so, you know, sometimes you attend a church and they're like, yeah, we're a missions church. We're all about missions. And so we're just going to say, hey, we're going to have a missions weekend, and we're going to invite you to give towards missions. And by the way, that's true for us. And, and, and we're all about missions. And so just because I gave my money and I'm praying for a couple of missionaries, therefore I'm missional, period. Good. Everybody feel good about that? You're not sure what the right answer is. <laughs> Well, then the pendulum shifts over here. And we're over here in terms of the, the pendulum is shifting. And it says, well, I'm not so sure, sure it's just about giving the missions. You know, I think I'm on mission when I'm at my job, I'm at my workplace. I think I'm on mission, and I'm on mission when I go home, and I'm with my family, and with my spouse, and with my kids, I'm with my family. I think I'm on mission when I'm talking to my neighbors. There's this universal calling that I'm actually called to make disciples. So I'm not only just called to be a disciple, I'm also called to make disciples wherever I go. It's a universal calling. Yeah. Which one's the correct one? I, I'm hearing people kind of guessing, oh, I don't know. Are we called to send or are we called to be on mission? Anybody know? Both. Pastor Zach, what do we say? Both. Come on, nice and loud. Both. Both. Some people are still not sure. <laughs> Let me be really clear. In January and February and into the spring, we're going to be going through a walkthrough of the book of Acts. And one of the things we discover within the book of Acts is the church is actually called to commission those within the midst of their church to be on mission. And so they gather around them, they pray for them, and they commission them on mission. Yes, let me be crystal clear. We are called to commission others in mission and for mission, both locally and overseas. Yes. But then I, on the other side of it, we are called to live on mission. We're called to be disciples. We're called to make disciples. We are called to live for him on mission. Anybody getting the flavor of discipleship? It is called to be on mission. Go! Go and make disciples. Just in a row. No. Go and make disciples of all the nations. We are called to commission. We are called to experience what it means to live out this mission. As I wrap up a, couple, a few final thoughts, I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. But I want to think about this ladder again. And if you want to imagine the, these rungs on the ladder, and, you know, very few of us would say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm right up there with Mother Teresa, right up there with the holiness and righteousness. Most of us would say, well, no, no, we're not right up there with Jesus. But we're somewhere on that spectrum. If you want to think like if you're furthest away from God, you want nothing to do with God, you're at the bottom of the ladder. And if you're walking so tightly with God and you're like the, the, the best Christ follower ever, you're right at the top there, ready for heaven, ready to rock and roll. Um, so if there's that spectrum, the question is, where are you? I think many times we need to be reminded of this beautiful, beautiful image that we read about today. Here's a woman who's feeling totally self-condemned in John. And Jesus walks up to her, gets down on her level, says, where are, you, are the, your accusers? Nowhere, Lord. 
when I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. I want you to know that you are loved today. And there is forgiveness found in Jesus. And regardless of what you're going through, regardless of where you're at, I want you to know that this is a safe place for you. Our second value is that you are loved and accepted. And that you are so, so welcome here. And if someone walks in this, these doors and you don't know and you're not sure if they really fit, guess what? They fit. And you go up to them and say, you know what? It's so good to have you here. We love you and we accept you. Have you said that to somebody recently? The second piece of this is saying that where are you going on this ladder? Are you just hanging out and just saying, I'm good on this rung? Because I'm telling you, Jesus wants to go deep with you. He wants to see your relationship grow and develop with you. Are you creating space for, for yourself to actually know Jesus in a deeper way? Are you getting involved in a campus group where you're, you're opening up your scriptures for yourself and actually digging into the Word of God and saying, what, what does this mean for me? How does this apply to my life? Because I want to tell you right now that Jesus wants to be in relationship with you. And he wants to move you up these rungs of the ladder. And I think closely linked to this is living out on this mission. We are called as the church and as individuals to live out mission. This is so closely linked to discipleship. Oftentimes people say, I want to grow my relationship with Jesus, but I, I don't want to serve. I don't want to be a part of anything. Now, let me tell you, that's the number one thing that's going to stumble you from actually growing in your relationship with God. If you want to grow in your relationship with God, get on board. Start serving at this church and another church. Uh, to figure out ways to be on mission for Jesus. Maybe it starts with just saying, hey, I, I'm wondering if I can help as an usher and, uh, and welcome people here. I, I'm pretty good at welcoming people. I think I should welcome people. Maybe it's getting involved in brewing coffee. Maybe it's saying, I really, I, I've been going to church a long time and I, I think it's time that I just start teaching some children what it means to know Jesus and trust Jesus. Maybe it, God's calling you here to say, you know, maybe it's time I need to actually start committing with giving to God's mission. Maybe I've never given towards a missionary before. Maybe I've never been a part of commissioning others in mission. I'm going to commit to praying for a missionary this year, and I'm going to learn about some missions in the coming weeks. I, I, I really want to do that. Let me tell you, God loves you. God wants to be in a deep relationship with you. And he wants and he's calling you to be on mission with him. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the powerful, powerful uh, example that you gave to us in your scriptures. That you're calling us not just to stay in our sin, not just to stay in this place of, of our filth, but to say, God, you are calling us to live for you. Go and sin no more. May we understand and recognize this call. That you are calling us to live for you in a glorious way. Help us understand this, Lord. Stand and worship our King, shall we?